um, it's an absolute pleasure to have Ambarish, uh, you know, kind of come and talk. Uh, you know, I have this fascinations with, uh, you know, all the online competition that comes in. Uh, not only so because, hey, you know, you get to learn a lot. Uh, but, you know, the first ranking solutions are always uh, very, very interesting. Uh, and Ambrish, you know, participated, you know, I let him talk more. Uh, but, you know, as when I when we saw his first abstract, you know, I was like, you know, why would you want to know penguins population and then realize that, hey, you know, it's very, very important from a climate change perspective, uh, because that's what they had predicted for. And then uh, I will let Ambrish kind of, uh, you know, talk to you more about, uh, you know, what the solution is, what is that session about, and then uh, we can take it up from there. Ambrish, over to you. Thank you, Setu, and I must thank the whole community for having me here. It's been an absolute pleasure, and thank you for all your time. So the talk is about uh, competition solution, the random walk of the penguins. And uh, you can find me in these links. Uh, we can talk about it later. But uh, this project is a huge project, it seems. And uh, I just participated in the competition, but there are many, many people who are working in research with penguins. I just wanted to introduce you to some of the main parts. There is MAPPT, which is like uh, this uh, site, with the mapping application for penguin populations and projected dynamics, which do a lot of work in penguins. There is Lynch Lab. Uh, which is from Stony Brook University, Heather Lynch heads this thing. And this is a competition which is a random walk of the penguins. So, and it is funded by NASA. So that's about the thing. And the competition was to predict the population of the penguins. So here, what happened was that uh, it is about penguin populations in Antarctica. Before the competition, I thought Antarctica is one island, but uh, ignorance. Antarctica is made up of many, many islands, and there are different kinds of penguins. So the data that we have here is only about three types of penguins. And why they did this competition was that this competition is funded by people who are actually ecologists, meaning they, they work on research with birds, seabirds specifically, and they know a lot about the ecology, the environment, but they wanted somebody outside to have a look and how can they predict penguins. So data science, as you know, is very domain centric, but uh, here, they bring in somebody, they brought in a huge community which did not know about penguins. So they wanted to see what can this community do. And it is quite fascinating. Me, who doesn't know anything about penguins with this population. So 605 participants, it seems that people did participate a lot, but some, some people lost interest because 675 is actually uh, not a lot of entries. So anyway, so that's the thing. So why worry about penguin population? It seems that they are very important ecosystem indicators. They look very nice on movies and all these things, but uh, they are important because they are uh, krill. I think that's some sort of vegetation thing. I'm not sure. Fish predators and the population actually tells you what is happening in Antarctica. But the problem is that the data on the penguin population is very limited because uh, I know of researchers who go to Antarctica and count penguins, but nowadays with drone, I think they can count a lot of penguins. So, so I think that's now improving, but the data is very limited. I will show you the data actually. That uh, and the data is very very patchy. Patchy meaning meaning you have data and then there is no data. There you have data, there is no. It's very patchy. The time series is short, and the statistical models require a lot of data. So what's the goal of the competition is to create better models to estimate populations for hard to reach sites in the Antarctica and to monitor the health of the Southern Ocean. So that's why they had this competition, okay? 
so here uh, we are having uh, so the antarctic continent has a lot of penguins but uh, the data that they are given is of these three types of penguins so gen 2 gen strap and the adel penguins uh, main thing that i wanted to show in this slide is that uh, the breeding pattern is different for different species uh, they have different diets they live in different islands in antarctica so their population is also governed differently okay so here is the snapshot of the data so what they had given is the site id meaning it's the island then you have the name of the penguin and then you have a time series data now to give you a glimpse this is just a glimpse of their count nn is not a number so that means there is no number you see the sparsity of the data there is no data anywhere so these time series algorithms are notorious in the sense that if you do not give them data they will not predict meaning in computer science they throw exception and it will not happen so we'll see of how i just wanted to show you a glimpse of the data uh, so this is they had data they have given a lot of data from 1873 but most of the data is from 1980 you see the blank spaces 83 to 200 2013 and what they wanted is that you predict 2014 2015 2016 and i think 2017 uh, yes so that's the thing that they wanted to do so this is the problem statement now i'll take a step back and uh, and i'll just try to formulate the problem so so this problem is a time series problem why because the data is time series it is like there is data and there is a time sequence to it other types of data is cross sectional data that means that at one point what is the data it is collected at one point like maybe uh maybe the transactions that have been done by somebody so as to detect credit fraud right you have you have data for all the transactions and there is whether it's a fraud data or it is not a, so that is not a time series data but this data is a time series data okay so we have to understand what type of data it is before we jump into algorithms and so and so forth so here's a formal definition i just picked it from one of the books talit uh, shemuli one of the professors is there i'll i'll also put forward the book that uh, i referred for these uh, the time series is a series of measurements of particular phenomenon taken over time and uh, this is a time series forecasting problem why because you have got data from say they gave data from 1900s but i didn't consider the data because it was all the very I mean, it was not there much so from 1980 i considered till 2013 and then they what they wanted to do is to predict for 2014 2015 2016 and 2017 okay so here's a book that i was referring to that uh, i've taken some inspiration of the slides from this book practical time series forecasting by shemili very very light book i would say so that if, if you are starting with time series is a good book i'll also tell you of the other book which i referred actually in the competition the fun fact is that i bought the physical copy of the book years back and as it always happens it stayed on the bookshelf for years every time i tried to read it i got distracted but then this competition was one good uh leave so that i could read the book but i didn't read the physical copy there is a free copy actually of the book uh, in web i'll show you the link so anyway so what is forecasting actually it is actually made up of different types of things meaning if we do it if we do it very systematically the most important part that we feel is modeling that is coming much much later and to be honest with you in this competition modeling was important and it's obviously one of the most important things in this competition but i think the real trick was actually 
the data uh, because since the data was so so very patchy we had to fill in the blanks the data so so i just go through the things which is in a uh, time series forecasting process first is a goal we know the goal the goal is to predict uh, the penguin populations so you get the data good thing somebody has gone to antarctica somebody has uh, done all the things for the data and they've got uh, the data for you and then you explore and visualize the series okay so that's here's the thing so when i looked at the data it was all over the place the visualization was not that great so so this fortunately won the first prize but there were other fantastic people who were doing a lot of other work and i could see so we had to submit so this competition went on for 61 days so you could see your position every day on the leaderboard so there were other people who solutions i will tell you where it is uh, very innovative solutions they tried to explore and did something i did not feel that you could get anything about doing the visualization of the seals because the data was all over the place you saw the data like it's very very patchy and the next important thing is the pre processing of the data that i think is the most important part of this competition how you fill up this data so that your algorithms behave properly we'll come to that and then you partition the series partition the time series it's very important it's not like any supervised learning thing that you take 70% of the data and you 30% you do your validation or something of that sort it's not going to happen that way because because there is a sequence to it so you'll have to take the sequence you'll have to take a percentage of the data but you have to keep the data in sequence you cannot take it randomly as you would do in a credit card problem or in any standard cross sectional data problem and then you apply the forecasting methods fortunately meaning we are very lucky there is a lot of research that is going on i am not a time series researcher and many of you may not be but the good thing is that there are fantastic research going on there's fantastic open source books there there is fantastic open source actually software packages in r as well as in python but i used r because i thought that uh, rob hindman's book as well as the package was impeccable and it helped a lot and then you need to compare and evaluate the performance that is very important you can do modeling but you should know how to compare whether that model that you are preparing is going to help you mind it we were not given the data that was actually going to be predicted so you are predicting for something you are predicting for 2030 14 15 and 16 so there you do not know the data and then you implement the forecasting system so this the last part actually we we implemented it but actually uh, the the team that is there uh, in mappt and uh, the researchers like grant humphries which i show you of how uh, he went about and wrote a paper so that the last part is there but this if you understand this is a whole process if you just jump to any of the process then it will not happen okay so so just to give you a glimpse that what does the data look like so there are three types of penguins these are the number of penguins uh, which is uh, there uh, i can use a pointer let me use the pointer so this these are the penguins with their uh, observations there are different sites and for each site which sites have these type of penguins so adel penguin is in 281 sites and uh, these are the things there some descriptive data is there now this is a count type uh, about the penguins about the nest i didn't use this data this data was already given so mind it the competition also said one thing that you can use external data for the competition sometimes not knowing something is a good thing uh, i did not know of how to use this external data maybe there is some external data uh, i didn't use any of it fortunately for me it worked 
So maybe that is the reason the ecologists wanted people who are not knowledgeable in ecology to find out with their limited knowledge what they would do if they didn't have the knowledge of ecology. Because I am sure that there is a lot of data on fish in Antarctica because they are the predators. Um, if there is a correlation between them, we could try to map the fish population with the penguin population. There is a krill, some, there must be some krill population or krill data might, might, might be there. I didn't look at it. So basically, I use this data, the simple data out there, and try to fill up. So what is uh, uh, prediction going to look like? So the prediction, what they wanted to do is that they gave the data till 2013. They wanted to predict from 2015, 14, 15, 16, and 17. Okay. I'll just pause here and... And I just see the different types of data that is available. So here you will have around uh, 548, uh, around six, six, 648 rows are available here uh, of these penguins and these guys are available. 648 combination of the penguins and the sites are there. So this is the data that you are having and you are going to predict from 2014 to 2017. So this is the thing. So another important thing is that uh, once you predict, how do you know that how good is your prediction? So in time series, there is a lot of things that happens. Uh, uh, accuracy measures are there. There are several accuracy measures. So what is an accuracy measure? It, so there is an actual value, which is uh, the, uh, which is the yt, meaning y is the value at time period t, and f is the forecasted value. Now the error is very simple, yt minus ft. And we measure the efficiency of a model by some metrics, right? You have to measure it. How good is your model? So this uh, NAEP is a very standard thing which people use. There are several others like MAE and uh, they, they modified in this, met, in this competition to use this mean absolute percentage error. Uh, so what is it actually? It's very simple, meaning don't get uh, bogged with this equation. It is ET that is the error by the actual value. Uh, they take a mod of it and then they multiply by 100 and then they sum it over and then they divide by the number of observations. So this is the error thing that how they measure of how good or bad my prediction is. Because, because everybody is predicting right. So I have to measure that who will come first, who will come second, who will come third. So they used... Uh, this competition used a different type of metric, which is similar to uh, this NAEP. But here, the only difference here is that they have introduced one very interesting thing, is the error reweighting thing, error reweighting confidence. So this, this is uh, confidence of the of the actual value. So whenever you are doing any competition, it is very important, mostly from a competition point of view, if you're doing a project, you choose your own metric. So that is a very important decision. But in a competition, it becomes easy uh, in a sense that you are governed by a metric. Uh, most people usually use a competition metric. I use the same metric. So this is the metric that uh, the, the competition uses. So you have to use this metric while evaluating your models. Okay. Now, here's the solution. The solution is actually divided into two major components. Uh, fancy name imputation, which is nothing but making, uh, pre-processing the data uh, so that uh, it becomes uh, good for the modeling. And then is the actual model building. But 
to be very honest uh, everybody knows what the models would be maybe they can uh, people are experts in tuning the models uh, they can choose the models but i think the most important part which is important in this competition and maybe in real life is the actual data so so here the data was patchy it was short uh, there were far more better people than me who were participating in the competition i think the real trick was uh, putting the right data filling up the data in the blank so what did i choose to do the imputation so here's the thing you i chose two different languages for modeling it's strange uh, because uh, for one reason uh, the r models the models which are used like the classical time series models arima ets profit uh, i think meaning they are available in uh, python uh, the implementation is very much available but uh, there are two factors one is i was more comfortable in those models in r and there is one free book which explains rob heinemann's book is there which explains how to utilize these models and these models are very statistically very very you require a good statistics background to tune these models especially arima it it requires a lot of uh, expertise to tune these models you require a lot of uh, uh, statistical background but the good thing is that there is some automatic tuning which is provided by rob heinemann's package which i tell you uh, that that helps you a lot so before i go into the models first is the imputation so this is another very important thing so this is i used the stein in imputation Uh, to fill up the values the last observation carried forward the next observation carried forward and replaced by zero and then in the python models it is linear next observation carried backward and replaced by zero i'll go into i'll try to explain i would say in a very superficial manner what these are some are difficult to explain and to be very honest with you i am no expert in them the packages were there i tried to read up and why i use this i will tell so the first one the stein this i think was a game changer for me so there is a package in uh, r which does this stein interpolation and if you read the paper uh, and this is usually very very much used in in oceanographic data so it is very reliable when there is abrupt changes in slope so how did i come to use this time interpolation i must say so the story runs like this so when i was testing the model so i divided it into the training set and the validation set so the training set in which you train the model and the validation set you validate uh, you do not train the data on the validation set you just test the data on the validation set so there a i was trying out these type of interpolation techniques and then suddenly i saw when i used the interpolation technique that is time the model accuracy the amap accuracy just just increased like abnormally so maybe the data that was filled up by time was fantastic so that was the thing it is uh, so it is uh, two to six times faster and it is more accurate so i tried different types of interpolation methods uh, the good thing is that you don't have to code all these interpolation methods by yourself you need to go to the documentation of these packages and understand what like it's like you are building a car it's like a mechanic uh, you know which which parts you need to put in the car so that it runs fine right so as the car mechanic would do i would tune the parameters and i would see that this is a thing that uh, really helped so stein was a game changer and then followed by it so there is the perform the last observation carried forward which is basically very simple it is easy to explain like if you have a missing value which is any meaning not applicable it just pushes the value carried forward and the backward is that it pushes the backward value. So 
So these are the things that are used. And lastly, if you, nothing works and it's all over the place, it's bad data, just replace it by C. So I know this is code, but I just wanted to show you of how small this code was. Obviously, uh, it went through a lot of iterations, 61 days. The uh, one portion of this is the core of this. If somebody would have asked me, Amarish, can you give me just one model in which I would make it very simple and do it? So this would be the model. So here, if you see um, the two things, there is time here, then there is uh, last observation carried forward, backward, zero. All these simple lines of code, this R part, but the most important part is that I used here these try-catch blocks, uh, meaning coming from a computer science background, it helps me because sometimes these algorithms give off errors because the data is so bad that, uh, that it would give me errors. So I tried this and it worked well. And here you see, I was telling you, this is the auto arima. Arima itself, um, meaning explaining Arima, I would need a session, and I, I try, I, I, uh, it would, it would require a lot of parameter tuning to get which is the perfect one based on the data. So this is a, a package which has been written by Rob Hindman. He explains in his book what are the steps involved. So this was very important, the auto Arima. Uh, so I used another. Uh, algorithm here, which is profit, which is also a time series uh, uh, package, which is, uh, I think it's a Bayesian, based on Bayesian uh, science. I'm not very sure of how, what is the uh, integrity of it, but it is actually used by the Facebook core data science team. And uh, they use it in Facebook and it is quite good. And uh, I try to use it and see of how it would uh, help in this. So trying to bring the best of everything, Arima, which is very classical, Profit, which is new, uh, done by the Facebook team. And there is fantastic documentation there. It is available in R or Python. Both are there. And uh, so, so what I did was quite uh, simple here. So, so. So there are 648 rows, right? So uh, so that would mean that every row is, is a model for me. OK. There are 648 rows, meaning there are 648 combinations of, uh, of this penguin population, as well as this. Uh, Penguin population and site ID. So this is one row. This is one model. This is one model. This is one model. So it might seem a very difficult for an implementer, but actually it's easy because I would just run it in a loop. But the point is that how do I tune it? So I didn't tune too much. I used auto arima for tuning for the auto part and I use ETS, which is another exponential time series algorithm. Uh, try to tune a little bit, but but I use the same tuning parameter across all the models. I do not know whether that is the best thing to know because uh, I try to keep it very simple. You know, sometimes if you keep simple, generalization is, uh, is good. But if you try to be very specific with your data, then the generalization is not good. The person who was coming first in the public leaderboard actually came fifth because um, I think he tried to overfit the data. That means he was trying to make the accuracy very, very high in the data that was given because unseen data, it didn't perform very well. So there is a lot of generalization in the sense that the models uh, were, 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 were all over the place and it, uh, different types of models were there for each of the sites and for the penguins. So, 
actually it was a lot of models because 648 for each of the things and five models five five algorithms so three to four zero models and uh, then i took the mean of the results to for each row to get the result so why this algorithm because there is a concept of ensemble ensemble means you you take the models and you take the goodness of each of the models and then you, when you combine them the combined result is a very good result so there are mathematical theories on it but um, to explain intuitively it is something like this that uh, uh, if you have variety in your approach some some parts would behave very well some parts will not behave very well like uh, in cricket you would have a left hand right hand combination when you put in it you guys watch cricket um, so so that's the thing more diversity in your model building may give you some benefit but the other ones the xg boost and rf this is a random forest and the xg boost model so these were supervised learning models to be very honest uh, i did not find a lot of improvement but i kept it because um, it was improving my score but if you ask me what would be the single most model i would have preferred i would have preferred the arima only and that would have seen me through in a practical implementation so what happened after that was that uh, uh, the organizers they distributed prizes for the first five and lucky to be the first but there were fantastic solutions and the the others also the team also had their own solution right this uh, ecologist team had their own solution so what they did was that to be all combined together to write this paper uh, you can find this paper it's an el cyber paper in ecological informatics i would encourage you to just see this paper and uh, nowadays you can easily find a paper and download it there is a blog also i would also encourage you to see this blog uh, it's it's not only has uh, the solution which i explained but it has uh, the other five solutions very innovative solutions other four solutions which are there written by people who are much more smarter than me so they are there and the best thing is that all the code that we have written by all the people is there in github so if you are interested you can look at the code my code will not be of the greatest standards uh, but uh, it's okay it was okay to win the competition and this is a book uh, i would strongly recommend you go and see this book this is by rod uh, rob hindman and uh, another gentleman had written this book very nice book yesterday i was trying to read the book so that i could make myself more knowledgeable before i speak i found it a little bit tough maybe if you are rusty it might be a bit tough but this book is open source but um, it's a great book i would encourage you you can there is code there there is theory there and it's uh, updated and there is a uh, galit's book also uh, which is a free mooc also if you, if you type uh, that name you can find out that book so the resources are there and uh, driven data is also a great uh, place where you can find competitions like this for social impact so if you are uh, interested you can go ahead and participate in these competitions and who knows you might win some some prizes some money and some good bragging rights so here is what so here is grant uh, grant has become a great friend of mine uh, he, he 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 was a lead person of uh, of this uh, writing the paper and he is a very well known person uh, in the ecology world and his uh, point was that uh, uh, he says that these competition showed some algorithms which are not commonly used in ecological studies like uh, people were very fascinated not by the accuracy i think by the diversity of models that we applied uh, one is a uh, profit which was a facebook one which is new and i tried to apply that so i think overall i would say this might not be a great thing 
for um, a person who is looking for data science uh, induction because first point which i always believe data science should be very uh, domain centric this approach is very domain agnostic but somehow it helped to win but in practice i think uh, we should combine the domain along with the uh, any study so that it brings much more flavor and it is not just model fitting here we tried and we experimented uh, like a computer science problem but holistically speaking i think grant and his team looked at everything and they took out the best parts and i think the model that they have now has taken the best parts of of all the models that we had given and has done something which is much more refined now. so i'll stop here and i'll see whether you have any questions uh, you can answer so that's about from my side so the how did you know to use time for data imputation of all the other methods very nice question uh, so so that's a very good question there is the uh, interpolation package in r okay so this interpolation package has several uh, methods so like a computer science uh, student i i tried all those methods uh, and uh, and tried to do uh, with that and it it gives it it gave all the things good results okay can you explain further how do you train a model with only one training data okay yes yeah, so so the training training data is uh, so i did this way it would have been better so i had uh, divided this this whole series into sets like the first first i would say 20 uh, first 40 or something into the training data and then into a validation data so that was the thing yes while i understand that ensembling helps with generalizing i assume uh, that for ml we should always try to use a lot of data yes that's that's correct we should always try to use a lot of data but unfortunately there is not much data but thank you for all your questions very nice questions Any other session? Any other questions? Thanks. Thanks so much for asking the questions. All right. If there are none, um, uh, Amrish, maybe you want to kind of uh, share your contact if you're okay. Yes, uh, yes, yes, yes. Your yes, uh, details on LinkedIn. Is that okay? Absolutely. So, so here's my thing. I am all over the place. So. First thing is that uh, NASA, you know, very, very generous of them to have a place for me. So there's a website there, uh, which I maintain, but not so updated, but I still, I would like to maintain it very well. There is a LinkedIn address. Uh, I'm very active in LinkedIn. So please ping me if you want to collaborate with me with anything. Uh, only only thing that, uh, which is, which all of us have limited to think is time. But I am very excited to collaborate. Mostly, I am trying. I'll tell you what I am trying uh, right now. I am trying mostly on computer vision nowadays. So, if you are doing any computer vision research, uh, yeah, please, please contact me. And if you wish to collaborate with me, that would be very nice. And obviously, for any other thing, please do con contact me. I am on LinkedIn. Very active. Uh, sometimes I post uh, things which are not related to data science, uh, so people ignore me. But uh, for that, but that's fine. Okay. 
um i think um, yes. there are no more i posted your blog and your link yes yes that's very nice of you very uh, very nice of you so i'm sure you, feel free to you know continue with uh, with him yes. the conversations offline and then um, take it up from there all right uh, thanks a lot amrish for your time and thanks all of you for uh, joining in i'm sure uh, this was a great session uh, we have another session join uh, starting in a few minutes i will uh, paste him, paste it here um, and then uh, you guys can continue on the rest of the global ai bootcamp thank you all thanks amrish for your time really appreciate it awesome solution um, i'm sure people enjoyed it as well and thank you all for joining in thank you thank you sethu for having me absolutely take care bye, bye.